The war in Ukraine has brought industrialized warfare back to Europe for the first time since World War II. While this isn't the only recent conflict in Eastern Europe, those were small skirmishes in comparison to the titanic amount of resources and manpower being levied by both Russia and Ukraine. This is more than just a clash between two nations, though, as a significant amount of the NATO alliance has thrown its weight into the mix. This is a clash between two major powers, Russia and the West. To date, NATO has not formally joined the war but has done a lot to support Ukraine's ability to fight off the Russian invasion, and even reversing the tide of the war. When the war started, Ukrainian troops were moderately armed and equipped, and the nation had no hope of properly equipping the hundreds of thousands of conscripts and volunteers that were drawn up after full mobilization. NATO quickly began to ship badly needed personal equipment, such as helmets, body armor, and even uniforms. Today, the average Ukrainian infantryman is far better equipped than his Russian counterpart, all thanks to Western support. The United States specifically has done practically everything to fight off the Russian invasion, except pull the trigger itself on the weapons it supplies to Ukraine. The vast arsenal of American reconnaissance and surveillance assets, as well as its huge intelligence apparatus, has been brought to bear on Russian forces with titanic consequences. Russian generals and senior officers are dying at an alarming rate thanks to U.S. intelligence and recon provided directly to Ukrainian forces on the ground via intelligence sharing networks. American generals even famously rejected the original Ukrainian September offensive plans and reshaped them in collaboration with their Ukrainian counterparts, leading to one of the most stunning defeats of Russian forces since the Russo-Japanese War. But the war in Ukraine has shown the world just how poorly prepared countries are for the return of industrial warfare, and France, along with other nations, are quickly taking note. The most striking lesson from the war in Ukraine is that Russia is nowhere near the military power it pretended to be. The second most striking lesson is that modern war against a near-peer adversary eats up resources at truly astonishing rates. Russian artillery is using up on average of 20,000 rounds of artillery a day, with a monthly average of 600,000. While most Western powers keep reserve ammunition in the millions of units, this still means that with current stockpiles, even a power like the United States can only undertake a couple months of high-intensity combat operations before they have to start being very judicious on their usage of artillery. And that's exactly the opposite of how artillery is meant to be used. To date, Russia has lost over a thousand tanks in the fighting, with that number spiking dramatically during the current counteroffensive by Ukraine. During this ongoing counteroffensive, Russia is estimated to be losing 10 tanks a day, an astonishing figure only made more astonishing by the fact that half these tanks are being abandoned. Ukraine, on the other hand, is losing two a day, still a very worrying figure for any military power, as losing 60 tanks in one month would be a significant number of losses for most armies. France, for instance, has just over 500 tanks, so this rate of loss would equal 12% of its tank forces every month, a completely unsustainable figure without some form of rapid replenishment. If France was losing tanks at the rate Russia is losing them, they'd be losing 20% of their force every month, going from unsustainable levels to catastrophic levels. For Ukraine, it helps that most former Russian tanks are now current Ukrainian tanks, as it's estimated that half the losses inflicted on Russia are being either captured or repaired by Ukrainians and put back into service on their side. When you become your enemy's primary supplier of heavy equipment, you're not en route to win a war, but you are at least making it very sustainable for them to continue fighting. That's unlikely to be the case for nations like France if they were to return to a state of industrialized warfare, which is why nations like France, the United States, and Germany are taking long, hard looks at their plans for high-intensity conflict and making preparations for sustainment of high-technology fighting forces over the long term. Preparing for high-intensity war means fielding forces that are capable of achieving victory in a high-tech future, and that's why France is currently in the middle of a 20-year modernization program named Scorpion. The program is meant to last through 2040, bringing France's military, already one of the most capable if not the most capable in Europe, up to the cunning edge with modern forces fighting with modern weapons and using modern doctrine. For this initiative, France has taken a page out of the US playbook. No surprise, seeing as there is heavy collaboration between the two nations in this and most other military matters. Currently, France's focus is on upgrading its light and medium tank forces to bring them up to a modern standard of battlefield connectivity. In the 1990s, the US delivered a shocking defeat to Iraq with absurdly low losses on its behalf thanks to a slew of modern technologies. But the most important of these technologies was the ability for the US forces to communicate and share data amongst themselves. In the modern battlefield, data is king, and the US has since then expended vast amounts of resources on what it calls Joint All-Domain Command and Control. This is a web of systems that networks US forces together so that all sensors and shooters can freely talk to each other. 
The best example of this doctrine came during the 2003 invasion of Iraq, on the push to Baghdad a single platoon of US Marines, performing recon ahead of an armored advance, ran into a significant Iraqi tank force. The Marines were equipped with heavy machine guns and a few tow missiles fired from unarmored Humvees. In theory, the Americans were utter and complete toast. Unknown to the Iraqi commander who eagerly ordered his forces to attack, the Marines were in direct communication with loitering aircraft, and within moments of spotting the Iraqi force advancing on them, they placed a call for fire support. A B-52 answered the call and using targeting data from the Marines, was able to locate the rapidly advancing Iraqi armor. The B-52 dropped six CBU-105 cluster bombs, a smart weapon capable of dispensing submunitions over hundreds of meters, with each submunition then being capable of identifying and targeting its own enemy vehicle. In one bombing run, the bulk of the Iraqi force was decimated, causing the rest to quickly retreat. The defeat of an entire Iraqi armored column by an infantry platoon may be one of the most lopsided victories in history. That is the power of data sharing and it's the type of capability that France is looking to bring to all of its ground forces. Under the name of Combined Collaborative Combat, France is undertaking a series of upgrades to help its lighter tank forces be more accurate, nimble, and have greater battle space awareness. However, there's a number of equipment upgrades also coming, or already being deployed by the French forces, one of the most significant hardware upgrades by any modern military power. The first of these is the EBRC Jaguar, a replacement for the 40-year-old AMX-10RC and ERC-90 Sagay. The Jaguar will look to take on both the recon and fire support roles for infantry forces from its predecessors, bringing logistical simplicity and increased capabilities to a modern force. But the upgrades to armor and its 40mm cannon are only the start, because this vehicle is meant to be cheap yet capable and easy to replace in high-intensity conflict. The vehicle's manufacturer is contractually obligated to keep the cost of each vehicle under 1 million euros, so the vehicle is based on a 6x6 commercial all-terrain truck chassis which includes using commercial truck engines. In case of a protracted war, this is a vehicle that's not only capable and cheap, but also extremely easy to keep building, as it required little specialized tools or knowledge and uses widely available commercial parts. By comparison, the American Striker costs nearly 5 million per unit. While you're getting significantly more capability for the price, it also means that replacing Striker's loss to wartime attrition is not only more costly, but more time consuming. The vehicle does use many parts common to US Army trucks, making logistics easier, but it doesn't enjoy the same commercial availability of parts or even a basic chassis as the Jaguar does. French infantry will also be seeing an upgrade to the VBMR Griffin armored personnel carrier, replacing the VAB its troops have been using since 1976. Once more, the vehicle is based on the same 6x6 commercial truck chassis, making production and maintenance easier in times of war. France has plans to buy nearly 2,000 of them to fully replace its fleet of VABs. Already we see two ways France may be better prepared for a protracted high-intensity war than the US. The Striker is a truly impressive vehicle, but it relies on specialized defense contractors to build. French infantry support vehicles may be less capable, but they are far cheaper and easier to produce given the wide availability of their commercial parts. Considering that the entire world has seen a shrinking and consolidation of their defense industry sectors since the end of the Cold War, being able to source your fighting vehicles from commercial sources is a significant advantage. Strikers may be able to perform better but will attrit quickly and the US will be hard pressed to replace combat losses until years into a war when manufacturing is finally spun up to its full potential. Meanwhile, French forces will enjoy far more rapid replenishment of forces despite a sacrifice on capability. Scorpion is only the start though, with the next phase of French buildup projected to start in 2030. Named Titan, this phase of France's modernization program is aimed at its heavy combat forces, things such as artillery, tanks, and helicopters. The early focus on lighter weapon systems is understandable, as France already enjoys very capable main battle tanks, attack helicopters, and artillery, but the delay is also pragmatic. France plans to begin Titan with an in-depth study of projected force needs even before a single replacement vehicle is procured. The reasoning is simple. Nobody has any idea what the future of war is going to look like. Militaries constantly make very educated guesses and carefully observe global trends, making adjustments as necessary, but with technology leading to capability leapfrogs, it's difficult to know what the future threat environment is going to look like. Add to this the very worrying trend of rapidly converting off-the-shelf commercial equipment into unconventional weapons of war, and a future combat environment may look like nothing that any power has currently predicted. Few, if any, observers could have guessed that during the opening days of the Ukraine war, commercial drones would become the conflict's defining feature, and one of the keys to Ukraine's victories over a far numerically superior foe. 
France and other powers expect that the future will be one fraught with anti-access air denial systems where no battle domain will be truly uncontested. This will include traditional A2AD threats such as kinetic kill systems involving artillery, suicide drones, and mines, but also threats in the space and cyber realms. Electromagnetic weapons such as the US's EM missile, capable of shutting down electronics in a specified area, will require not just one but a network of solutions to ensure friendly forces can fight and win the day. As the A2AD threat environment continues to evolve, forces will require an onion-like layer of defenses, necessitating connectivity, situational awareness, and the ability to rapidly react to a variety of threats, often simultaneously. To this end, France's push to network its forces is a solid step forward. Lessons from Ukraine have also told French observers that infantry mobility and awareness is crucial to victory, and here too France is well on its way to meeting the challenges of tomorrow. What remains unknown is the fate of heavy combat systems. In Ukraine, we've seen Russian tanks taken out by cheap commercial drones armed with nothing more than just grenades or mortars, and manned portable air defense systems have made the use of Russian aviation on the front lines an incredibly risky proposition. Figuring out how to defeat ever smaller, more portable, and harder to detect threats will shape the way that heavy combat vehicles are designed, used, and deployed in combat. However, one key deficiency highlighted by French analysts is that its forces lack serious depth. Geared toward fighting fast, mobile skirmishes in sub-Saharan Africa, French forces would struggle in a high-intensity conflict such as that in Ukraine. To that end, France is looking to build up its combat forces, but like many other Western powers is also taking a serious look at how to ensure its defense industry can stand up to the challenge of quick and long-term resupply of combat losses. Here it joins the United States and Germany, who have also both identified serious deficiencies in their ability to manufacture large amounts of heavy equipment. In the US alone, hundreds of factories were shut down at the end of the Cold War, and US tank production today stands at about 60 vehicles a year. In war, it's estimated this number could be ramped up to 20 a month, but this would hardly put a dent in potential losses against a near-peer foe. How France and its friends respond to these challenges may decide today if Western allies win the wars of tomorrow, but for the first time in 30 years, the Western world is once more preparing itself to wage global wars. Now go check out What If Ukraine Joined NATO Today, or click this other video instead.